don't make friends because they're too painful to lose. And uh, I had a, a young man thrust a, a gun at me and I had to uh, neutralize him. So I spun around, did 180, and in doing so, my wingtip, left wingtip, port wingtip, hit the ground and sheared off about 12 feet of it, and I came, I, I, I came down in a heap. But as you, you must know, uh, the war in Europe started in September 1939. And in September 1938, our um, Prime Minister of the day, uh, Neville Chamberlain, came back from Munich where he'd met Hitler, waving a piece of paper, a famous, infamous piece of paper, on which Hitler had said he had no more territorial ambitions. And uh, our Prime Minister believed him, one of the few that did. So uh, there was general rejoicing in 1938 because the, uh, the, the, the population at large figured that that was it, there wasn't going to be a war. But those of us who had the advantage of military people in the family or were from a military family as I was, uh, knew that that wasn't going to be the case. So in 1938, before the war started, I joined the embryonic uh, air raid precaution organization and spent some months learning how to dispose of poison gas because gas attacks were a real bogey to us because our senior members had uh, experienced that in France and there was the evidence of that all around us, the gas uh, affected people. So it was a real bogey and I felt that um, it was a useful thing to do uh, on the assumption that there would be gas all over the place. But fortunately, uh, good sense prevailed and the Germans and the English, and I think by arrangement, although I, there's no evidence for that, said, okay, no more gas, because if we do it, you'll do it, and that won't get us anywhere. So it was a worthless exercise, but not at the, not at the moment, not, at, the, not at, that, at that moment. And then when that threat faded, I joined the embryonic air raid precautions, uh, the anti-invasion forces, because we knew, or felt that we knew, that uh, we would be invaded by Germany at some time or other. And at, um, at 15, I was part of anti-invasion forces, uh, mainly because I demonstrated that I knew how to fire a rifle and usually hit what I aimed at. Um, as I remember saying before I got clipped around the ear, yes, I can, uh, I can shoot the eye out of a fly and I can specify which eye. Bonk! <laughs> <laughs> um, and that continued all, all the way through 1939 up until the advent of the Battle of Britain in, in, uh, in the summer. And uh, after that, I just stayed on the ground and watched it all from the ground up. Went out into the fields around London, because I was in London all the time, looking at the crashed aircraft and uh, getting my first impression of what death looks like at 16. Um, then nothing really much happened. I continued doing my military training in the Home Guard. Uh, I volunteered for the Air Force at, seven, at 16 and a half and was too young. It didn't take you until you were 17 and a half. 
So they 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 had my they had their hand on my collar, but they weren't putting me <laughs> putting me in yet. So as the Battle of Britain progressed, it was obvious that Germany was not going to invade us, um, not uh, by boat across the Channel because they would just get decimated. The channel, quite apart from anything else, was very, very dangerous water. And uh, I wouldn't have liked to have uh, come across under fire. And of course, we never did. We, uh, we went over to uh, Aramash and Normandy when eventually we got strong enough to invade. However, um, the Home Guard was was a sort of um, civilian militia. It was composed mainly of uh, World War I retreads who were invaluable because they, they knew what warfare was like. So we young kids, uh, and I was only 16 I think, uh, we were well trained or well acquainted with what it could be. And uh, in, in England at that time, there was a great deal of sympathy to the German cause, mainly because so many of us had German ancestry, as indeed you did here in America, which gave rise to the um, German-American bond, which was a real threat, or you thought it was a real threat, as we thought our German ancestry people would be a real threat to us. And uh, many of our senior members just disappeared. They went underground. They did their normal work, but during the hours of off-duty, they practiced assassination and uh, other types of uh, mayhem. Um, I was quite young, as I said, so it was unlikely that I would be asked to play the assassin, but I knew who our targets were, and I still do. However, that was that, um, and uh, then the blitz happened. I've got some books there which you might like to see privately as well as for this. Um, the, the, the London Blitz, and I, I, I worked in air raid precautions all the way through that um, when I was 17, 16 and a half, 17, and it was a, a very traumatic period. Um, it wasn't quite as dire as reports have it. There was a lot of humour. Uh, the, the Londoners are... are quick to see the humour in, uh, in situations which don't appear to be particularly f funny. And one story that I particularly enjoy, which I didn't, I didn't uh, witness, um, the, the, uh, the, the, the heavy rescue boys, the, they were the ones with the muscles and they, they went around tearing bits of masonry down digging people out of rubble and all the rest of it. And their humour was not only uh, quick, but pretty obscene too. <laughs> they were quite a bunch. However, the story is that uh, one man was uh, digging around and he thought he heard a voice, so he shouted for his mates to be quiet, and they did. And they did, he did hear a woman ask, ask him for help. And he rummaged around and found her dragged her out, elderly woman of 60 or 70, stark naked. Her clothes had been blown off by blast. It was a very common occurrence. Um, and uh, he said to her, oh come on Ma, you always call these women Ma, even though they might be younger than you. Come on Ma, make yourself respectable. So she looked down and saw that she was naked went back into the rubble of her house and came out wearing her hat. 
Um, high explosive blasts does funny things up here. And there are other stories of that sort. People doing the most incredible things under the influence of high explosive. Um, and just fear. However, um, I continued to do that. Um, I, I, I went into the, the East End of London to uh, help rescue work because the East End was very badly hit by the bombs, particularly on May the 10th, um, where the whole of uh, the city of London went up in flames. So I experienced that. I was very fortunate in that neither I nor my family, either before the war or before they entered the services, were, were hurt seriously at all. In fact, the only one who had any damage was me. I, um, I was going on duty and was making my way to the school, which was our headquarters, and was convinced that something had gone wrong at home. So I, I ran back and found my mother, who was alone, trying to do something about an incendiary bomb, full of thermite and other... Yeah, uh, inflammable things and explosive so um, it, it had come through the ceiling the roof come through the, the ceiling into the corner of her bedroom where my clothes cupboard was went down and uh, and was burning there between the rafters and I knew that if nothing was done it would just burn the whole house down and the neighbouring houses too so not having any equipment there, I just poured a bucket of water down the hole. And I knew what would happen, of course. I dodged back and avoided the, the worst of the, the heat. But nevertheless, I lost all my hair, all the skin on my face, my hands, my arms, and so forth. And, but, the, but, uh, but, but at least I put the bomb out. Our, um, our emergency dressing station that evening was fortunately manned by my family doctor who knew me well and knew the SKs I got up to when I was a boy, young boy. So I knocked on his door and he turned round and swiveled his big wing chair and looked at me and then he dogged me. And I thought, oh, God. Actually, it was quite inspired, really. He um, injected a note of normality into a very abnormal situation. Because although I wasn't badly affected, the burns were superficial, horrendous but superficial, I was on the edge of panic. And he calmed me down. And eventually he turned around and said, well, we stuck his... his um, thumbs in his waistcoat, his vest, and said, well, young Brown, what have you been up to now? <laughs> and of course, that was, uh, that was, um, that was enough to calm me down. So he dawned me with anti-burn ointment and sent me on my way. And next morning I went to work. Everybody did, no matter how badly, if they were mobile, they went to work. Nobody mentioned anything. No one said, are you all right, or does it hurt? It was just routine, just routine. In fact, I was working at Sir Lavaga House. I'll show you a photograph of that. Um, Sir Lavaga House uh, on Trafalgar Square at that time. It was a government office and absolutely full of very... Um, personable young ladies and about the only effect of that injury was that for about six weeks my strike rate among the girls <laughs> rather fell off <laughs> but the, um, the scars, the, the, the burns healed and my hands, my hair grew back and by the time that happened it was time for me to go back into the, go into the Air Force I was then 17 and three quarters 
and they called me into the Air Force to start my pilot training. Joining a, a, a military organization was a bit traumatic, very different from a, a civilian military organization. It took a bit of getting used to, but I came from a military family, so I uh, uh, cavalry, so that I, I, I got a, I had a rough, rough idea of what will happen. And the early days were fairly uh, uneventful. And the most eventful thing that happened was that because there was a, a, a war going on in Britain and it was dangerous for trainee pilots to go wandering around the sky with Germans wandering around the sky, uh, it had been agreed and organized before the war that uh, Britain would not be able to accommodate um, large-scale training in the event of there being a conflict between Germany and Britain. <coughs> So, we were dispatched to all over the world, South Africa, Rhodesia, New Zealand, Australia, a lot to Canada, and a lot to America. In fact, there were quite a lot of us here before Pearl Harbor. Um, it was a very secret affair, offending the, um, the Neutrality Act. Which, which, which America followed, of course, at least officially. But um, <coughs> they did all they could um, to help us with equipment and so forth. And my rifle in the, um, in the home guard was a Springfield. Yeah. Best weapon I ever had. Really? Wonderful. However, so, <coughs> um, those of us who were over here before Pearl Harbor came here in heavy grey British flannel suits in summertime to Alabama. <laughs> um, they were based at Montgomery and did their training at Gunter Field, which was just outside Montgomery. And when we went into town, we had to be careful that nobody recognized that we were British. Which, if you think about it, was a bit difficult <laughs> with this voice. <laughs> um, but it was, um, it was interesting. We were well received. Um, and then, of course, with the advent of uh, Pearl Harbor, everything was in the open. And uh, from there I went to Ponca City in Oklahoma, where I did my, my training for seven glorious months. <laughs> um, we, would, we were very well received, and a, a number of uh, families, particularly the women, said, I wouldn't say that we were glad about Pearl Harbor, with all the distraction and the deaths and so forth, but at least it relieved us of the fict fiction of being isolationists because we weren't. We had to behave like it, but we weren't. We wanted to, <coughs> we wanted to get in and help. So that was that. Um, and when I go back here to Ponga City for Memorial Day and other events, it's like going home. And when I lecture here, depending on my audience, I often say that I've talked to you today as a, a part Anglo, a part Oki, and a part Tessian. <laughs> <laughs> um, it was um, it was very formative that period, and. Um, it's not something that I forget. In fact, I think that <coughs> those few months um, had more effect on my adult development than, than all that I did at home. Meeting new people, getting new points of view, and then of course going back home and uh, starting operational flying. Uh, so that's the story up to now.
Okay? Yeah. Of course, being a thorough going Englishman and uh, uh, an archetypal, archetypal fighter pilot, up here, <laughs> I hoped that I would join a fighter squadron. And my, my, my instructor, um, tell you a bit about my instructor in, in America. An American who had been a, um, a, a, an airmail pilot, also um, a crop duster, all sorts of things. Great guy. Um, he, um, very soon he, he, he figured that I knew what I was doing, or at least I thought I was doing what I was doing, and uh, he said, well look, there's not much point in me teaching you anything, I'll sit in the back and you just do what, I, what I've already told you to do, and if you do wrong, I'll tell you, and if you do right, I won't. So I just flew around virtually by myself, in um, a Stearman and then in an 86 um, not really knowing what I was doing but instinctively doing the right things his name was Wampler and he was very keen on f force landings or simulated force landings and of course uh, uh, Oklahoma is just one big landing field really but I noticed that more often than not we went to a particular emergency landing field where there was a radio mast and a windsock and a flag. And I wondered why. And he said, he would say, well, taxi up to the end, turn it around, turn it off, and I'll go and get you a Coke. And eventually it occurred to me, why does he go and get the Coke from the radio shack? I could go and do that myself. So, one day I wandered down and knocked on the door and opened it and there he was with the radio operator on his lap with a skirt up around <laughs> her neck and he said, get up Brown, you're too young for this. I said, well no I'm not sir. <laughs> great guy, great guy. However, um, so, I hoped I would go on a fighter squadron, but I finished up flying four engine bombers to start with. Uh, not four engine bombers to start with, two engine uh, training aircraft to start with, and then four engine bombers. And I was engaged mainly in supplying um, goods and um, uh, armaments and, and people to the, to the um, resistance forces in Europe, particularly in Norway, flying there and dumping this stuff, all these people out by parachute, of course, we have too big an aircraft to land, especially in Norway, where there's nowhere to land. Um, what, kind of, what kind of planes were you flying then? Sorry? What kind of airplanes at this point? Sterling four-engine bomber. It was the first of the four-engine bombers which first flew in 1935, the same year as the B-17 first flew. So it was contemporary, but not as good an aircraft from a bomber point of view. Uh, it, it was, its, it's ceiling was limited, uh, about 10 or 12,000 feet, which was tantamount to flying down the muzzles of the machine gun. So we, we didn't do much bombing. We got in there and got out as quickly as possible quite fast but uh, and very comfortable and quite big inside I mean that the, uh, the Lancaster and the Halifax which were later four engine bombers were very cramped but the Sterling was like you could always hold a dance inside of <laughs> almost anyway so I did that for a while then I, I started flying um, paratroops and glider borne troops and uh, at that time there were a lot of pilots, a lot of air crew hanging around waiting for postings. So I volunteered for airborne forces and flew gliders into Europe. 
uh, which wasn't the most sensible thing I ever did, but uh, I got out of it without a great deal of trouble. Um, and I continued doing that until early 1945, when by pulling every string I could find, I got some time with an American fighter station in England flying P-51s for a while. And that was the story. That was the story. To my knowledge, I didn't kill anybody, although I must have done because I was dropping things that were pretty heavy. And uh, of course, in airborne forces, I was eyeball to eyeball quite often. So it was an average sort of war. A lot of us were geared up to do a lot more than we did, but the opportunity were very scarce, you would be surprised, because there were so many of us. There were 75,000 RAF pilots who wanted to, who, cadets who wanted to be pilots, and we all graduated during a period of about two years. So we had to fight the scratch to get, get killed. Um, and we did many other things in the meantime. So back um, to the, the uh, Battle of Britain when you were a kid on yeah. the ground watching that, and you would kind of go up to the crashed airplanes and, and stuff like that. What for you back then? What was that like? Go, I mean, were the pilots still in the airplanes or something? Like often that? was really. Usually the Germans rather more than the British. Um. Well, um, you called me a kid, and I was, but a kid, a child at war is very different from a child who's not. And uh, I, I was from a military family, um, cavalry. So my, uh, my elders made sure that I knew it wasn't going to be a, a walkover. So I, re me, I really went to look at those aircraft to see if I could find a souvenir or two. I never did, uh, that I could call, haul away. Um, It's a, it's a remark that people who haven't done it don't understand. There was a war on, and that was it. You just cope with what happened to you. Um, like the burns, it didn't really worry me, mainly because I knew that they were the minor burns. Um, Um, I would say that my most um, I would say that my most um, dramatic period was when I was flying gliders and uh, eyeball to eyeball is a bit different than 20,000 feet um, I, I, um, I had to play the soldier there um, and I was equipped to do so with a machine gun and a pistol and all sorts of other stuff. So um, some Germans perhaps still bear the marks of what I did to them. Uh, it was it's them or us, or him or me. Um, the, um, the Hitler Youth were particularly troublesome because they were kids and they didn't really understand. They didn't really understand that if they shot at somebody, 
that person would shoot back and if it hit it would hurt they didn't really grasp that so they were unnecessarily brave or stupid and uh, we had a lot of trouble with them um, what were some of the things that the Hitler youth do you remember any situations that you encountered with them well one of our operations we had to neutralize a town called Hamingkel which was a railway junction and uh, if we didn't do that the chances were that the Germans would use that railway junction to bring in the, um, the panzers by rail so it was our prime target and we wiped off the, uh, the station and the crossroads without a great deal of trouble but then the, um, there was some opposition and the um, the the the, um, the Hitler youth were very um, antagonistic, stupidly, stupidly. A number of them got shot simply by being antagonistic, because if someone points a gun at you, you assume they're going to use it. Not that they're just going to point it at her. And uh, I had a, a young man thrust a, a gun at me, and I had to uh, neutralize him uh, with a with a knife. Um, not seriously, but I, I, I neutralized him. Uh, I hope he still feels the pain. Um, because you see we had commando training and uh, knife throwing was part of it so I got him from about 15 feet away uh, badly enough to stop him and he cried he was 13 I don't know I never asked <laughs> um, so that was one episode Another more amusing one, um, when that, during that particular operation, the, uh, the opposition had been quietened down, there were a lot of prisoners to be taken care of. And I had a whole bunch who were in command, or at least in control, uh, of um, a German major. And um, he indicated to me um, that I shouldn't worry too much about him not doing his job, which at that time was simply to take care of his prisoners, or our prisoners, but his men. Uh, in, in other words, he wasn't going to start any, any sub minor war. So I gave him a nod, and uh, it was a sort of mutual affair. And uh, eventually, uh, when we were all together, I walked up to him and said, uh, anything I can do, everything all right here? And he replied in, in language that was English. And I said, um, have you been in England? He said, yes, I was at uh, Winchester, which was one of our public schools, one of our main public schools. So, and I noticed that he had a, a bulge down here, under his jacket. So I pointed at it and said, come on, because I knew what it was. It was a war trophy. And he said, unloaded, empty, empty. I said, let's see, empty, empty. And he brought it out of my finger. It was... Um, a Colt 45 um, automatic which he'd taken off an American soldier I didn't ask whether the American soldier was dead or alive it wouldn't have been politic 
However, I said, come on, let's have it. And it was empty. He'd taken the magazine out and moved the slide, and I knew it was empty, and I said, okay, well, <coughs> I won't say anything if you won't say anything. I'm sorry to pinch your souvenir, but I wanted a souvenir too. He said, well, <laughs> he said, all right. And off he went. I never saw him again. I never knew his name. I did know his name, but he had gone. I'd like to have met him again, however. Um, and I kept that weapon until our, our people, our home office in England in uh, about 19... Hmm, 1975... Sixty-five decided that no civilians should be armed, and we had to give out give up all our guns. I had a a Mauser which I brought back from Germany. I had a um, a, a British my own um, target rifle two two, which I'm desperately sorry to lose. I had my own Webley Scott. I had my own. Um, Browning automatic. I was a walking armory, and I had this thing, and I had to give them all up. But what I did, I gave the Colt to our. I was I belonged to a gun club, and our gun and our, our secretary was um, a gunsmith. I said, look, this is 45. It, it's, I don't want to give it up. Can you deactivate it? and keep it for me. And he said, uh, I don't know about that. So go on. So he did. And uh, it's on his, in England, it's on his mantelpiece with a little um, legend of how he came by it. So that's it's, it's, it's some record. But we had to give everything up. And uh, our crime rate went up by 45% overnight and it will happen here um, what else can I tell you those uh, <coughs> those gliders were, the, were, the, were those the horse gliders that's right Okay. Um, whenever you landed were you, uh, you said you were very close to the enemy sure how, can, do you, can you tell? Uh, can you tell me in detail some firefights or engagements that you had with the Germans? Well, um, this was on the Rhine, and the air was full of smoke. Um, the smoke of battle and also smoke screens which was set up by the uh, British Army to, uh, to, to cloak the, uh, the, the approach across the water, across the Rhine, by boat. So it was almost impossible to see when you got down low. At 25 feet up there, I couldn't see the ground. I could see the tops of the trees, and I knew how to avoid those. So um, I, I, you know, I just didn't know what I, well, I had a rare, a fair, a fair idea where I knew where I was, but not precisely. So there was no point in milling around. I just decided to go straight down and hope for the best. And uh, so I did that. And then looming out of the trees, there was a forest. And if I'd hit that, I would have been shredded. I had 32 troops with me in the glider, fully armed troops, and my co-pilot, who said, fucking hell, <laughs> it's a blind forest, Rick. Um, so I spun around, did 180, and in doing so, my wingtip, left wingtip, uh, port wingtip, hit the ground and sheared off about 12 feet of it, and I came, I, I, I came down in a heap. The aircraft was smashed 
none of us were hurt, and we got out without being interfered with by an 88 millimeter gun emplacement, which was about as far as those chairs there. And we got out as quickly as possible and uh, lay in a, wasn't a ditch, it was just a, an indentation out of range of the guns which only went down so far, they didn't go right down. Although, of course, they were anti, uh, they were um, uh, artillery as well as anti-aircraft. Uh, Fortunately, um, the, the 101 Airborne, some of the 101 Airborne had been dropped in the wrong place, parachutes, and they were very close, they were closer than we were to those chairs, and they said about the, um, the crew, of, 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 the, of the gun crew, and, and neutralised them. You know what I mean by neutralised? Um, and they were just standing around wondering what to do next. And let's leap forward about 50 years. Um, one time when I went back to Ponga City on a reunion, I met the brother of one of our old female link instructors who said, Oh, you were a glad pilot, were you? I said, yes. He said, were you on the Rhine? I said, yes. He said, no, oh, yeah. I was dropped on the Rhine and uh, we were in the wrong place at the wrong time. I said, he said, in fact, I really got decapitated by one of you boys. I said, oh, how was that? He said, well, there we were, standing around the gun wondering what to do. Because there was nothing, the rest of it had been and a, a glider came over the hedge and whistled over our heads about three feet up, went on, did a, a 180 degree turn and, and dug his wingtip in the ground and crashed. I said, Joe, believe it or not, that was me. And it was. Wow. He exchanged notes where it was and what time it was. And yeah, I very nearly chopped his head off. <laughs> <laughs> amazing, amazing. What are the chances of meeting that man? More than you think. Really? More than you think. Um, we, um, after that, we made our way to our rendezvous point where my uh, someone who became my, 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 my dearest friend was already there. He was also an RAF glider pilot. And he looked, he'd been there long before me, at least three minutes before me. <laughs> so he looked at me and said, oh, hello, Rick. What kept you? What kept you? I said, well, I had a bit of trouble out there. He said, oh, yeah, so did we. And that was it. Um, and uh, there again, I met someone who I, and I met other people too. God, bloody hell, fancy meeting you here. Oh. And um, we went into Hamminkel. Um There was nothing much going on there except somebody was up in the, ch in the church tower with a machine gun just spraying around willy-nilly and uh, I was with a, an army group at that point and the man said, the, the lieutenant said, let's put a bomb up there. I said, no, come on, look at them, look at them, look at them, look through your glasses. And they were women, women who would, uh, oh yeah, oh yes, you see, they, they were Germans, it doesn't matter whether they were women or men, they 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 had been, they had been uh, trained to resist the enemy. What else? The fact that later on, 
many of them were sleeping with the enemy, it's neither here nor there. At that point, they had a, a, a Schmeisser. Have you ever heard of Schmeisser machine gun? Like tearing calico. <laughs> and you didn't muck around with those things. So they sent two or three fellows in to winkle these girls out, and they came down with their, with their hands up. They were lucky to be alive. They could easily have been shot. However, on I went, and uh, ultimately we were directed to a tented camp where we were to stay until means was found to take us back to the Rhine. And as I was sh sh shepherding my crowd back, by which time I got rid of the, 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 uh, the prisoners, they're all my own boys, who should appear but uh, an army glider pilot who was on the same squadron. His name was Cartwright. And uh, in the usual army fashion, they found uh, an alliteration for him, especially since he was about two inches taller than me and about 50% more handsome than me and 100% more fortunate than me with, his, with the ladies, <laughs> he was an absolute devil, so they called him Killer. Killer Cartwright, can't you remember? <laughs> and it so happened that he lived only a few yards from me. Well, no, 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 a few hundred yards from me. So he said, oh, hello, Rick, how are you doing? You all right? Okay? Meaning, have you been hurt? I said, no, I'm fine, fine. No problem at all apart from crashing an aircraft. Um, he said, well, do you want to sleep under canvas? I said, no, I hate sleeping under canvas. He said, well, I've got myself fixed up with a sympathetic, sympathetic frow. Um, do you want me to find someone for you? So I said, sure. So off he went, and eventually he came back and said, I found somewhere for you. Come on, I'll show you where it is. It was a farmhouse occupied by a man of, he must have been at least 90, and his wife of at least 80, and that was my company. <laughs> Never mind about the, the, the young Frau. <laughs> no, that was a bone of contention forever afterwards. <laughs> uh, Killer Cartwright, Jack. <laughs> great friend, great friend. The main differences were one arising out of development because the hurricane flew before the war. Although it was a very, very stable aircraft and people who flew it loved it, it was very stable from a, from a gunnery point of view, as it had to be with 12 machine guns. Um, every, every, every aircraft is the same in a, in a way. They've each got a control column, which may be a stick or it may be a wheel. They've each got rudder pedals, one for each foot. Um, and they've each got a selection of essential instruments. The bigger the aircraft, the more instruments. The bigger the aircraft, the more instruments, the more people you need. But fighter pilots, of course, were law unto themselves. Buses. <laughs> um, yeah, they um, the, uh, the 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 bombers. Of course, they had a crew of uh, the Sturdy had a crew of seven. So the Lancaster and the Halifax had. Eight or nine, depending on the uh, the mission. Did you fly all three of those? Hmm? Did you fly the the uh, no. Sterling? No, 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 no. I got rid of four engine bombers as soon as possible. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't want to do that. No. Well, what, did, what did you think of the Mustang? Anybody who flew the Mustang, if they survived, 
has got a love affair with it. It's a very, very pilot-friendly aircraft. It could still kill you if it was stupid, but it was, um, it wasn't as roomy as the, the jug, the Thunderbolt, as I'm sure you remember Charlie talking about that. It was, uh, it was faster than the jug. Um, it was altogether a more maneuverable aircraft. I can't compare it because I never threw the, 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 the jug. I'll accept Charlie's word, believe it or not. <laughs> um, It could, in, in a phrase, it could turn. It could turn on a sixpence. It could certainly turn inside a ME one hundred and nine. I never went up against a, a one hundred and ninety in it, but I understand from what I've read that it was a, more than a match for that. Um, Did you ever have any encounters with the enemy aircraft? Yeah. yeah. What, what happened um, there? But not, not in the, uh, not with, they made sure I didn't because I was relatively ignorant. Um, all I did, all I did, I, I was engaged in uh, escort work. And my, uh, my number one was uh, in charge of me. He said, look, we're going, I forget where our target was now, it was in Germany, but we're not going to take you there. We cross the border and then we come home. And when you see me do that, you bloody move or I'll shoot you down. <laughs> so I went back under escort and uh, that was it. The hurricane was different. I, um, I got tangled up with um, ME-109s in hurricanes. Um, but fortunately, um, I, I wasn't hit in any vital place with the aircraft, I mean. And as far as I know, I never laid a hand on the, on the Messerschmitt. And for some reason, they weren't interested. That they were to start with, but they found more likely meat elsewhere. And off they formed up, and off they went and left me all alone. Um, but that was an experience. I was able to draw on the uh, instructions of my squadron mates who told me to do this if such and such happened and not to do that and I just did as I was told and managed to avoid any, any damage but if you're looking at me as a fighter pilot don't because I wasn't um, I flew fighters but I wasn't a fighter pilot um, why do you say that? Because a fighter pilot, by definition, is someone who has been in combat with the German Luftwaffe, and I never was, not really. Um, and I think Charlie would, would, would agree that he too flew fighters but wasn't a fighter pilot. Because on only one occasion did he tangle with the Luftwaffe, and what he did, he put his tail down, screamed for, for home. Um, I don't think he was ever in a dogfight. I'm not denigrating him. But, you know, if he was able to avoid it, you avoid it. You don't, unless you're some sort of ace, fighter pilot ace. You, know, you went looking for trouble. He really found it too. Like Robin Olds, oh God. How he managed to survive, I don't know. Um, so, um, the Sterling was a very good platform. There was plenty of room inside, and plenty of things to get caught up on, but the, it was quite roomy. 
and one could move from back to front without a great deal of trouble. Um, we didn't have ball turrets, fortunately. Um, but you could go back and give the rear gunner a cup of coffee, a cup of char actually, see, which um, quite often I did if we were well on our way back and were unlike to be overtaken by German fighters. Because the North Sea is no place to uh, ditch in. And I never did. So that's, that's about it. <coughs> did you all, all aircraft have got a propeller, and they've all got a stick, and they've all got a rudder bar. And whatever you do, they all behave in the same way. Some faster than others, but uh, they all, oh, you know, you do that, it goes that way, you do that, it goes that way. You do that, the, limit, the wings fall off. <laughs> <laughs> did you lose any friends during the war? Oh. I didn't expect that one. You don't have to, if, you're, if it makes you uncomfortable, you don't have to answer. Um, I did. I did. Um, as you go through training and then on squadrons, um, you pick up acquaintances. If you're sensible, they stay as acquaintances. If you're stupid, you allow them to become friends. And you don't make friends because they're too painful to lose. But there were a number of guys who I earmarked as being the sort of fellow I like to get to know after the war. And they all of them were killed. All of them were killed. Um, some within my sight, others not, but none of them survived. So, in 19... Uh, Thirty-seven, I suppose it was. After the war, I thought to myself, you know, there's nobody left that I give a hoot for. There's nobody who's done what I did, whatever little it was, to whom I, I can talk afterwards. So I cast around in my mind and thought, yeah, Arthur might might be the right sort of guy. Arthur lived in Yorkshire, which is in North England. So without telling him, I was still in uniform, he had been demobbed. Um, without telling him, I thought I'd go up and just say hello. No more than that. So, I went up by train, I had his address of course, and I knew I had to walk to his address. And it was passed by a trolley bus. You know, trolley buses, yeah. And uh, there was a manic figure on the running board bringing, bringing the bell, which he shouldn't have been doing. That was, that was the job of the conductor. And it was Arthur Rushworth, this guy. And he turned up and said, what the fucking hell are you doing here? <laughs> I said, well, <laughs> I've come to find you. I don't think he's cried so much since he was a child. <coughs> and we stood on the pavement in uh, Manchester Road, Bradford, with our arm. And uh, Arthur has remained a friend uh, ever since. He now lives in um, Lancaster, Pennsylvania, with his second American wife. 
you only have one, one at a time. <laughs> yeah, and I'm I'm off up there quite often, and he's been down. He's been here. You see what goes on. Great friend. He's an only only child, and so am I. And that was a bond. It was a brother we didn't have. And uh, I was speaking to him only last night. So, yes, I lost a lot of friends. The, the first one I lost, and I'm not too sure that I did actually. Um, I talked about incendiary bombs. I'm going back in time now. Incendiary bomb was full of thermite, phosphorus, and other things that went bang. Yeah. And uh, one way for us to. Um, put them out was to stamp on them. We were wearing, wearing very heavy hobnail army boots and if you stamped on the end you excluded the air and it usually put them out. Occasionally it didn't, especially if there was any explosive in, and sometimes there was. Not a big explosive, but just enough to blow a leg off or to disembowel you. And my first really traumatic experience was helping my platoon sergeant, my platoon officer, whose name was Mortimer, who had done that, had stamped on one of these things and it had exploded and it ripped his stomach open. And in the middle of a blitz, in the middle of a school playground, I helped him push his intestines back into his stomach cavity. Um, he was in pain, of course, but conscious. And eventually they heard my cries for help and they sent a stretcher and they took him to an ambulance and that was the last I saw of him. I never saw him again or heard from him again. I was doing another job. So he was my first loss, and it's the one that I remember particularly. But uh, and one or two others hit me very hard. Um, but it was, it was war. You, you knew that if it wasn't them, it might be you. You knew that the, 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 the machine gun bullets which missed would not have missed if I ducked or stood up or... So it was a fatalistic kind of feeling. Um, even the blitz, the Luftwaffe was showering London with bombs, showering London with bombs. Um, You got used to listening to them. You heard one go overhead, another one, another one, another one, and then you waited for the next one, hoping that it was going to miss and not hit you. It was dicey. Um, and naturally, it was worrying. You didn't want to be. I seem to remember thinking to myself, well, I don't mind being killed, but I don't want to be disfigured. I don't want to get finish up with no legs or something like that. I remember thinking to myself, which was no thought for a boy of 16 to have, but it was a war. Um, It was, um, it, it was, it was different. If you haven't been through the bombardment of your home, then you cannot know what it was like. You know up here, but not here. But we made the most of it. Donations can be made to the Veteran Tales Project on our website at VeteranTalesProject.com.
www.thinkingmusicsmartphones.com. Thank you for watching.